I'm going to read to you. There's so much written about Lua Getzinger, but uh, so that we get an overview uh, and an, a good summary, a read article written by Amin Demil, uh, who was published in Baha'i News of December 1971. That's the year I was waiting on Biden. So it's it's a it's pretty pretty it's about maybe a few pages it's it's a good article to read and then we'll make points because there's some things that uh, he doesn't raise and I want to be able to go back to my big thick file from Wikipedia that had 150 notes footnotes from newspaper articles that goes into some detail of some something so. Um, I start reading this one and then we sort of go on to those, those other comments. So Mrs. Louisa A. Moore Getzinger was affectionately known by the Baha'is as Lua. She was also called the flame and Liva, which in Persian means banner. Abdul Baha named her the herald of the covenant. The guardian wrote of her as the mother teacher of the West. See, God passes by page 257. And as you know, she was born November 1st, 1871, and passed away on May 2nd, 1916. And she was she was like 43 years old. Lua in Persian means flag, and you must be my flag and wave it in the east and in the west. Abdul Baha said to Lua Getzinger when she visited him as a prisoner of Akka, a member of the very first pilgrimage from America in 1898. Uh, uh, just as in parentheses, you should look up on Google. There is a, uh, I forget the name of the, of the lady, under Lua Getzinger. I think she was a counselor at the International Teaching Center, but she wrote a book on Lua Getzinger and it's one hour and 30 minutes, a presentation that goes back to the, this first pilgrimage. It's a lot of details about the people I mentioned last time, Kerala and, uh, and Adad. But it's a wonderful thing to listen to if you get the chance. So stepping up to the lovely uh, young woman standing beside Dr. Edward Getzinger, Abdul Baha seeing with his spiritual vision, her capacity to become one of the great teachers of the faith of Baha'u'llah, put something into her mouth saying, I have given you the power to speak and loosen your tongue. Dr. Getzinger, we'll come back to him eventually. I, I wanna make some comments about, about him and his wife. He tells us of the scene. I think I mentioned that last time, but since I'm reading it, I'm reading this article and I, I have to go over some of those things. Then the glorious servant of God gave an exhortation into which he put such spiritual force and emphasis that it seemed as though the very walls trembled and we were hardly able to stand on our feet. Abdul Baha was declaring that the millennium had come and the kingdom of God was to be established on earth and that he wanted Lua to proclaim it everywhere in a loud voice. Now this husband and wife standing next to each other, Abdul Baha, looks at her so the wonder why her why not him you know those are the mysteries you know of, 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 of people you know he saw her as the herald and from the beginning she was able to speak fluently and brilliantly and without fear in any gathering because of the precious gift bestowed upon her by the master. In May Maxwell's words, as Qurratul Ain was the trumpet of the dawn of the, the Orient in the day of Baha'u'llah, so Lua, Aurora, shall wave forever and ever the banner of the dawn in the day of the covenant. 
During the next 18 years, she returned again and again to Akka and Haifa to receive Abdul Baha's instructions. You know, it says again and again she went back. She went back eight times. And every time, as you know, you have to take this big, big boat and spend 14 days as to get to to get to Egypt or to get to go to Haifa. Eight times. And to receive his instructions. And as he entrusted her with many delicate and difficult missions, and she traveled far and wide in the Orient, Europe, Africa, and America under his guidance. On one of these visits, he said to her, thou must be firm and unshakable in thy purpose. I guess I read that too last time. And never, never let any outward circumstances worry thee. I'm sending thee to India to accomplish a certain definite result. Thou must enter that country with a never failing spirituality, a radiant faith and eternal enthusiasm and extinguished inextinguishable fire a solid conviction in order that thou mayest achieve those services for which I am sending thee. Let not thy heart be troubled if thou goest away with this unchanging condition of variability of inner state. Thou shalt see the doors of confirmation open before thy face. Thy life will be a crown of heavenly roses and thou shalt find thyself in the highest station of triumph. Strive day and night to attain to this exalted state. Look at me. Thou dost not know a thousandth part of the difficulties and seemingly unsurmountable passes that rise daily before my eyes. I do not heed them. I am walking in my chosen highway. I know the destination. Hundreds of Titanics may sink to the bottom of the sea. The mad waves may rise to the roof of heaven. All this will not change my purpose, will not disturb me in the least. I will not look either to the right or to the left. I'm looking ahead, far, far, piercing through the impenetrable darkness of the night, the howling winds, the raging storms. I see the glorious light beckoning me forward, forward. Qarrutulayn, Qarrutulayn had had attained to this supreme state when they brought her the terrible news of the martyrdom of the Baha'is. She did not waver. It did not make any difference to her. She also had chosen her path. She knew her goal. And when they imparted to her the news of her impending death, no one could see any trace of sorrow in her face. She was rather happier. Although she never cared for dress, that day she wore her best white silk dress and jewelry and perfumed herself with the most fragrant attar of roses. She hailed the chamber of death as a happy bride entering the nuptial bower of the bridegroom. To this lofty summit of unchanging purpose, thou must attain, like Corratul Ain, nothing must shake thy firm faith. With such a divine confirmation and assistance, Lua's teaching tour of India, accompanied by her husband, that was her last, that's her eighth trip to the Holy Land, you know, and then to India. Accompanied by her husband was a complete triumph. She lectured at the Theosophical Society Hall in Surat on purity and divinity. In Bombay, she spoke in Pratana Mandir Hall for an hour on the Baha'i movement, its rise and progress. She addressed the students of the Theistic Society on individual spiritual progress. And in the ideal seminary, she spoke of service as an agent of worship. In addition to the public lectures to large and enthusiastic audiences, Dr. Mrs. Kessinger, Kessinger who kept busy meeting people of various creeds, Lua's most important interview, and the one which Abdul Baha spoke of as a certain definite result, was with the Maharaja of Jalawar, whom he had met in London. He wished to acquaint this receptive, enlightened person with the Baha'i teachings and chose Lua to seek him out. 
the Maharaja received her most graciously and afterwards corresponded with her, remaining a staunch, staunch friend of the faith. Another mission entrusted to Lua, we might, we might talk about it a bit later, probably the most far-reaching in its influence was the interview in Paris with Muzaffari Din Shah of Persia. She presented to him a petition asking that he stop the martyrdom of the Baha'is in the kingdom, in his kingdom. This he promised her he would grant. In, 18, in 1910, Lua and her husband were in America making their home in Washington, D.C., teaching in the surrounding cities, notably Baltimore and New York. In December of that year, there was an exchange of letters to and from the Holy Land, written by Lua for the community on the ever-recurring subject of a visit of Abdul Baha to America. To the attractive May servant of God, Lua Getzinger, your epistle was received and the desire and request of the loved ones and the maid servants of the merciful became known. The conditions requisite for the coming of Abdul Baha to those regions have just been written for the friends and maid servants of the Lord through you. I am hopeful that those conditions will be carried out perchance at some time a trip to those regions may be taken. But if these conditions be not realized, this will hinder a trip to those parts. The conditions of his coming were given in a general letter. And I quote, if the beloved of God in all America strive for unity and harmony, attain perfect love and accord, and act according to the divine teachings and the precepts of the blessed perfection, this will prove a magnet attracting Abdul Baha to that, so that perchance he may journey to America. But until the light of oneness, unity and love shine forth from the lamp of America and the beloved act in accordance with the divine teachings and precepts of the blessed perfection and all the believers in America become united and harmonious, my coming will be hindered, nay, impossible. Therefore, strive ye that ye may become the embodiment of teachings of the blessed perfection confirmed in the divine precepts, resurrected, in holiness and purity, severance, humility, and meekness. Set aglow with the fire of divine love and loosen your tongues with the praises and commendation of the heavenly kingdom. Thus may the great attainment be realized upon ye be Baha'u'llah and Abraham. Signed, Abdul Baha Abbas. Yeah, uh, as we all know, you know, these conditions of his coming, these are the conditions in which the faith grows. If there's no conditions like this met, faith cannot grow. Baha'u'llah is not going to let his faith grow when the conditions are not met, become very useless. So that's applicable today in our communities, of course. Accepting this challenge, as well as a call for more intensive teaching in preparation for the long for visit Lua, Dr. Amin Farid, I think this Amin Farid was a problem in the future because he, I guess he broke the covenant. He traveled to the West Coast and began to call the people of, to the kingdom of Baha'u'llah in Southern California. In the spring of 1911, glowing reports of the success of their efforts were circulated. They began their work in San Diego where there were no non-believers here, among strangers, they gave the glad, new glad tidings in a public hall and two, two men's clubs. Soon, some prominent citizens became attracted and opened their homes for meetings, and the numbers of believers grew. The two messengers of peace even spoke on the battleship California and across the boundary in Mexico. I think they went to open the faith in Tijuana. Dr. Farid was asked by the Red Cross commander to act as a surgeon in the field, and Lua was installed as one of the nurses. Several newspapers reported this work and called attention to the two Baha'i volunteers so that when they returned to Los Angeles, many came to their lectures. Lua addressed an audience of 400, also a large session of the World Spiritual Congress in Long Beach. A center was established in La Jolla, it is estimated that during this campaign, at least 5,000 heard for the first time the words of Baha'u'llah. 
In the San Francisco Bay Area, where they continued their work, interest was rapidly developed. Dr. Farid was introduced at some of the prominent clubs and spoke at lunches and functions of the Masons and Knights Templar. He and Lua were invited to lecture at the Unitarian Church of Alameda. President Taft in the city for the dedication of the 1915 Panama Exposition was a guest at the luncheon of the United League where Dr. Farid talked with him briefly, congratulating him in the name of the faith on his efforts for arbitration treaties and promotion of peace between nations. Lua's work was no less strenuous and important as she was invited to speak before the women's clubs. One outstanding presentation was given at the Jewish Ladies Council San Francisco. Over 900 were present. The platform was arranged like a Persian home and the Persian tea party was given by Mrs. Ketzinger, assisted by several friends, all in costume, appearing as Persian, Turkish, Egyptian, and Jewish ladies after the tea serving. Ms. Getzinger talked of the Baha'i influence and the effects upon the lives of the women of the Orient, and Dr. Farid arriving as a guest at the party and garbed as a Persian. Garbed as a Persian sheikh also addressed them. It was successful and delightful way of presenting the glad tidings of the Baha'i movement for women. Thousands were hearing the message in the Bay Area. In Berkeley, she met with a group of writers at Santa Rosa with the Saturday Morning Club where many school teachers and a few ministers heard the message. At San Mateo, the Federation of Women's Clubs invited her and with Dr. Farid, she made a trip across the Bay to San Quentin, in Palo Alto. She addressed a large meeting of faculty and students, Stanford University, my university, preparing the way for Abdul Baha's visit there the following year. In San Francisco, they were given a reception at the Sequoia Club, composed of literary and professional people. They were entertained at the Century Club and spoke on Persian poetry by request. A series of nine lectures was given in San Francisco at the California Club, presenting the faith in detail. These were well attended by a thoughtful, earnest audience. They were repeated at the Bellevue Hotel. So. Lua gave her whole time and divinely bestowed talent of beautiful speech to sowing the seeds for the coming of her beloved Abdul Baha. Finally, the great message of acceptance arrived. Abdul Baha would come to America. Dated December 16, 1911. The tablet reads, O ye friends of God and the beloved maid servants of the true one, Abdul Baha has the utmost longing to meet you and hopes that during the next spring, no obstacle may arise so that with infinite joy and fragrance he may hasten to America to meet the friends, to unfurl the banner of rejoicing, to spread the glad tidings of the kingdom of Ha, to illumine the meetings and gatherings with the rays of the Son of Truth, to perfume the nostrils with the fragrances of holiness, to impart gladness and delight to the hearts, to attract the souls to the realms of might, to grant the outpourings of the Holy Spirit, so that this netherworld, the congregation of the righteous ones, may firmly be firmly established. So during the months that followed his arrival on April 11, 1912, on the steamship Cedric, it was Lua's great joy and privilege shared by several others of his near ones, May Maxwell and Julia Thompson, prominent among them to be with him constantly and to serve him. Sorry, my face was hidden by this sheet of paper. They followed him from city to city, arranging his appointments, preparing his apartments with flowers and every comfort, receiving his many guests and the seekers who streamed to him day after day and far into the night. When they tried to protect him from these demands, when he was wary of exhaustion to exhaustion, it was not permitted, for he always insisted that every guest, especially the poor and humble, be shown utmost courtesy. The children, too, he never denied, but drew them into the circle of his arms, lifting them to his knees, whispering loving words in their ears. On one occasion, when he was particularly tired but would not stay in bed and rest, he said to his anxious friends, I do not work by hygienic laws. If I did, I would get nothing done. 
I work by the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. On the great occasion when Abdul Baha was announced at the National Convention in Chicago, April 30, Lua was on the platform speaking. As the master walked down the aisle with his stride of a king, the vast audience rose as a man and in breathless silence stood while he proceeded to the stage. The story of those exalted days of his presence in America cannot be told here. Lua was always near, sharing with May and Juliet intimate moments and an ocean of profound experiences. May Maxwell said afterwards, the months I spent near Abdul Baha in New York would have done more for education and enlightenment of my heart and conscience than all my life's experience. The three close friends were present at the moving and significant scene which took place on the porch of a home in Montclair, New Jersey. When the master spoke to them of the death of an early martyr, Juliet writes, suddenly his whole aspect changed. It was as though the spirit of the martyr had entered into him. With his head brilliantly, thrillingly erect, snapping his fingers high in the air, beating on the porch with his foot till we could scarcely endure the vibrations set up. Such electric power radiated from him. He sang the martyr's song, ecstatic and tragic beyond anything I had ever heard. Lua Getzinger herself possessed the qualities enriched through love and obedience of the martyrs. No doubt Abdul Baha saw these attributes of her soul at their first meeting as did her husband, when throughout the years he accompanied her on her arduous tours. He wrote after her death, in these journeys, she never spared herself time and time again. I have seen her in a state of utter exhaustion, yet she would pull herself together by sheer willpower in order to keep her appointments. Utter exhaustion. She knew but little rest, but Abdul Baha said, day and night thou must engage in spreading the message, nothing else will avail thee. She was often ill, having to remain in bed after a heart attack for long periods. In referring to one of these illnesses, Abdul Baha said, I told the angel of death to stay away. Such was the importance of Lua's qualities and services for the establishment of the cause during those early days when believers were so few and scattered when there would be but one Baha'i in a whole nation, even on an entire continent. January 1915 arrived. Lua arrived in Haifa. I think that was the last, this is the eighth pilgrimage, and remained there as a guest of the Holy Family for seven months. This was her last visit when news came of the possibility of America declaring war and the United States gunboat came to the very port of Haifa. Abdul Baha Abdul told her that now was the time to leave and take news to the friends in Egypt, Europe and America who had been cut off from correspondence with the Holy Land during the war. It is a long time that they are without any word, he said, and the desire to send you to them after which you are to go and teach. From Port Said, Egypt, my hometown, I was born there, right where she was. I was born 30 years after she came and she passed away. September 20, 1915, Lua wrote to Zainat Baghdadi in Chicago. I arrived in Port Said, so tired and exhausted that I could do nothing but talk to the friends. Praise be to God. When I left, Abdul Baha was in good health though surrounded by difficulties and dangers which I'm powerless to describe. What he has not done for Syria, such suffering as was, was manifest on all sides can scarcely be believed. People were coming day and night begging and weeping at his gate. He became the sole comfort and hope for the people, whether they are believers or unbelievers. I'm sent forth again to herald the covenant. I am sent forth again to herald the covenant by its holy center, and I shall do it with his divine assistance better and more powerfully than I have ever done. To Mr. Joseph Hannan in DC, she wrote, Abdul Baha said, tell everyone now is the time to teach and spread the code. 
all these days of trial and test, the whole world has been flung into the melting pot. Each individual soul must be put into the crucible and tried as gold is tried and refined as silver is refined. Because of the covenant, the center of the covenant now sitteth as a refiner, and it is he who judgeth the purity, capacity, and station of every servant. He is the divine assayer who accepts and rejects. He alone knows the hearts, and in him only can one find justice and truth. He is the judge of the high court in the supreme concourse, who renders judgments in righteousness and stations, and stations the souls of his sincere worshippers. In this day, all must be sure that he is the center from which every living soul is sent forth, and to which every faithful and faithful one must turn. At this time, writing, she enclosed the most important tablet in which he confirmed her loyalty, which on the surface would seem completely unnecessary. He has said to the beloved of God in America, on them be glory and bounty. The maid servant of God, Lua, was a long time occupied in India. In spreading the fragrance of the love of God, she is now ready to return to the regions of America. Show her every consideration. She is firm in the covenant of love. In reality, she worked vigorously during his sojourn in India, and she is worthy of love. By this tablet, he was restating his instructions of several years standing. I think I mentioned that last time that many, uh, this warning was given to many people in America about people coming without his, his authorization. He says, highway robbers are many and hypocrites are innumerable. The wolves clothe themselves with the shepherd's garment and thieves show themselves in the form of watchmen. Hereafter, if any Persian Oriental come to those parts, even though he be from the very city of Akka. If he find he does not possess a letter written by the hand and sealed by the seal of Abdul Baha, you must decidedly avoid him. Signed Abdul Baha Abbas. Leaving Port Said, uh, Lua sailed to Cairo, expecting to depart shortly for America, but was taken ill and was forced onto more once more to take to her bed. She was cared for most tenderly in the home of the Baha'i host, Mirza Taqi Isfahim, and his family, but her weakness lingered on through the winter. Before and after this illness, wrote a friend, although she never recovered her strength, Lua was, went about with heroic will giving the Baha'i teachings, her work being chiefly among the young men, as they are the ones, only ones among the Egyptians who know English. All listened to her eagerly, and all were wonderfully uplifted and blessed by her influence. She was the power of the words of Baha'u'llah upon her lips. In the early spring, she moved to Shubra, a suburb, to the home of a believer who greatly desired that she should remain with his wife and family for the sake of her uplifting influence. It was here that she spent her last days. She writes to a friend less than a month before her death. Little by little, I'm seeing all the reasons why many things are as they are and the lessons I have to learn thereby. I'm sure that until the last day of our lives, we'll be learning lessons for this world is a school from which we graduate only when we leave it. The lessons of the earth, of the earth world, she learned beautifully in those last days of illness and trial. Her suffering had a purifying influence upon her and seemed to burn away all the dross and leave her pure gold. She had only love and forgiveness for all. She saw that every experience had been for the best. Like an angel ready to enter the kingdom of light, she turned her face a few days before her departure to the picture of the center of the covenant, which hung on the wall, and said with tears in her eyes, but with manifest firmness, all I want to do is his will and to be severed from all else of God. During the night of the 2nd of May, 1916, she woke with a severe pain in her heart, although the doctor was called. 
she had passed to the kingdom of Abha before he arrived. The grief for the friends was very great, for all loved her as a devoted sister. A choice site was purchased for her tomb and every loving service performed for his, this beloved of Abdul Baha to honor her in the last, her last meeting place. There in Cairo, Egypt, Lua, the banner of the dawn, the herald of the covenant lies buried far from the land where she sowed the seed from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the land where she arose like the dawning star heralding the light of Baha'u'llah. In those days when the Occident lay frozen in the grasp of materialism without home, money or earthly hope or refuge, after her years of suffering, service and sacrifice, she attained her supreme desire and lay at last a martyr. Now, so, uh, that was the article that appeared in, uh, in uh, Baha'i News, written in 1970. Now, um, there are many, many little points that uh, uh, that are made now in in um, in this compendium of of little bits of things that were, that, that uh, Wikipedia mentions that uh, are referred to coming from different sources and I don't know there's like 150 sources. It's something that I sort of kind of felt kind of sad about that I didn't know much about and because you have to read the, the full biography of of uh, Lua. Um, but it seemed that towards the end, her husband left her. He, I guess he divorced her, wanted to divorce her. He, I, guess, I guess the law wouldn't permit it. And I couldn't really, I couldn't swallow that. That really upset me. Trying to, trying to understand it. Um, she had many detractors. Many people didn't like her. You know, it's like I was jealous of her. I don't know. But her husband was with her in uh, in India. Uh, but at one time, just left. He just left her. And uh, I don't know what kinds of things that were said. He thought she was saying about him or she was not very close to him and he felt that that he couldn't stay with her i mean he just basically left he just abandoned her now i was trying to find out exactly the wording that they used in this article about about that that sad episode yeah Uh, so by June of that year when she was in India Edward Getzinger was traveling separately from Lua but communicating with via telegram Lua was feeling alone yet he was unwilling to travel with her and she was running out of money and unable to pay for her trip when Edward left her local Baha'is offered to pay her way to Haifa in July Edwards leaving her affected her health in August into October, during which she had lost 28 pounds. There was a threat of arrest because of his German background as W World War I approach while in British India. Lua was concerned that what Edward might be saying about her in late October while feeling alone. She says it was the last human tie to break and he broke it ruthlessly. She wrote in the letter, Biographer Catherine Jewett Hogjensen marks Edwards leaving India as the end of their marriage. She obtained the passport from the American consul in Bombay in early November. Now, I just think extremely sad. Maybe people guys don't emphasize too much of that. I mean, it's like it's no big deal, but I mean, this is horrible. So all the services that she that she rendered um, it is part of Abdul Baha's plan to send people to different places I guess and they in this article is mentioned that such service was part of overall effort of major sequences of action managed by Abdul Baha 
for the first troubles to begin to spread the religion around the world. One was, one was the Dreyfus and Barney couple on a world tour and the Getzingers and Stannard to India and Agnes Alexander and others to Japan. So, uh, They make a very funny comment here. I have to read it to you because I read it myself, so why should I keep it from you? It says that they explain that this relationship changed because in some cases in marriages, uh, the intimacy is lost when uh, one of the members of the couple becomes very religious. That's what it says here. I'm just going to read to you. Uh, uh, well, let me just read this part. Uh, Lua left India in November 17, was born in 1914, and arrived in Ottoman Palestine December 3rd. At some point, Lua joined in some relief assistance with a Persian Baha'i doctor as a nurse serving in a Druze village. Edward had been in America and returned to Haifa to provide money for food relief during the war before America's involvement, but Abdul Baha had to refuse because of the high suspicion and threats in the area. Edward also consulted about his marriage while in Haifa, including January 26, February 5th, 1915. A meeting had been held in Haifa seeking reconciliation between Edward and Lua. He felt she had indulged in backbiting about him and that he had personally suffered because they had no wife, based on the diagnosis comments of the doctor. If Lua had a limitation of the spirit, which she must overcome, I cannot figure it out in any other way that she must have had an affair to understand what had happened to her in her behavior with respect to him and examined whatever the truth or the details and points of view of Edward and Lua. But present in modern literature are cases of changes in marital intimacy following major changes in the religious feeling. Edward filed for a divorce from Lua, which was then published in the newspapers in late 1915, repeating it into August. Edward was then asked about how this relief fund was dispersed rather than return, became very upset over the demands asked of him from donors and continued to complain of the questioning for two years and about which may have been the final blow which determined Edward to sever all ties with Lua in the judgment of Lua's biographer. Still, Lua didn't know he contemplated divorce. Lua says when Edward left he did not want her to return with him because of some Baha'is were being unfriendly to her but she did not consider this a rupture of their marriage so in some quarters her independence and styles were criticized among Baha'is and called her a Magdalene and her status became conflated with the failure of Farid to remain faithful to the Baha'i covenant the only legal option for divorce in D.C. at the time was because of adultery and was that way until 1935. Edward tried to minimize publicity of seeking a divorce, even to moving to other areas that allowed other means of divorce. But there two delays mounted and he felt an urge to return and be done with it. In letters of Edward in America, he maintained she had not been a wife to me for nine years, her lacking affinity to do so, he said, she said. Uh, anyway, so that was that was one of this kind of very sad things, you know. And I read a memoriam article on uh, Edward Kissinger, in which he said that well, she was really there to promote. I mean, she, her interest was the missions for the faith. He was more. He was a doctor, right? He was an osteopathic doctor. He was more concerned about. Um, divine spheres and about philosophical questions and and uh, and I don't know if towards the end he was not as active as he as he was supposed to be although he met Abdul Baha so I understand when Abdul Baha looks at both husband and wife he sees and he saw her he saw in her the capacity poor woman just and just a, just a, just a pure saint. It's just amazing. Now, speaking of the geography of the next world, see, I always believe there's a geography of the next world. Now, Abdul Baha did not know that she had passed away for four months. Four months. 
didn't know. Communications were really cut off with Holy Land between Egypt. Now, let me tell you what Abdul Baha said about, uh, you can just find it. I find what he said. Oh my God, this is important to me. Oh my God, this is the problem with all this. Oh, thank you. Sorry. And this is the, the geography of the next world. In case you didn't know what was happening in the next world, I'm just giving you an, an idea. Now, Abdul Baha was informed four months later, delayed by war, time communications. So around September 1916, he wrote a prayer of visitation, which says in part, now, it'd be nice to find that whole prayer. That was the, the, the major researchers in this scripture. She's going to find it for us. She says, oh, Lord, this is a part of it, oh, Lord, Grant her a palace in the neighborhood of the most great mercy. It's not a house, not a dwelling. A palace in the neighborhood of the most great mercy. Cause her to dwell in the gardens of the paradise. The most high. Illumine her countenance with the effulgence of their good pleasure in the kingdom of their glory. So, we have news for you guys. There are places where you can go. So, she gets a palace and she gets gardens. And I guess there must be, there must be layouts that we cannot believe in the next world. Now, I don't want to read it now because it has nothing to do with it, but you know, it's it talks about the importance of like nothing really matters in this world nothing strictly nothing whatever we do is basically worthless except if it is you're going and working for the <laughs> for the kingdom i mean the kingdom of god and the kingdom on earth and the kingdom on earth it, I mean, it's never going to stay because you know people die people go things are destroyed you know upheavals happen Things disappear. And so Bahala, maybe I'll talk about it when when I actually talk about some of the men. If I get around to talking about men at all in this series, because I'm, I keep talking about Ambudu. Now some my screen disappeared. Okay. I want to see the faces of the friends, and you guys will eventually get a copy of that. I will send it to you all. Okay, you get it. You get it all. Uh, when he was telling words of Abdul Baha to Howard McNutt after the Titanic disaster. And, uh, you know, I'm going to say that when I talk about Howard McNutt, because he is the one that collated all the, the talks, you know, of. Uh, all the talks of the, the promulgation of universal peace. I probably end up talking about men because I, I started talking, when I, we started talking about men, we, we talked about I have to go to, to men eventually again because I don't know, I mean, I'm not done with the women yet because there's so many of them. But uh, it's hard to understand how that boat, boat sank, the first maiden voyage. Now, I'm not going to talk about with what we said about the people that died, and you know, you can't expect anything to last in this world. But let me just read for you. I mean, you, you know this, but I just dumbfounded reading about what that boat was constructed in 19, whatever, 12, 13, 14, whenever it was. What contained, I mean, you've seen the films and all, but listen. The Titanic was the largest steamship ever built. She was 882 feet long, 96 feet wide, displacing 45,000 tons. Her luxurious appointments included a theater seating 1,200 people. This, is, this thing is floating. A theater seating 1,200 people, a church somewhat smaller, a ballroom accommodating 500 couples, beautiful salons, palm courts, gymnasium, 
bowling alley, tennis court, and the swimming pool, she could accommodate nearly 4,000 passengers and carry the crew of 860. She set forth on her first and fatal voyage from Southampton, England, April 10, 1912, the pride of her builders. At 18.40 p.m., sunk, hitting a mammoth iceberg, tore her open her hull, and in two and a half hours, sank in 2,000 fathoms, taking over 15,000 souls to the grave. Water is there. Anyway, so he was trying to explain to him what, what this world is about and how he should be attached to, to those spiritual things because everything disappears. Now, uh, in, in some of the some of the things I read about the, the, what she what uh, she did in Paris when she got an appointment to meet with um, the Shah of Persia, she it was very brave, you know, and she she asked for an appointment. Now, uh, let me see exactly how it described how she she managed to to speak to the Shah. Okay. It says in July 5th, 1902, Lua got a passport in her own name in New York um, and lists various facts of her life, like she was born in Hume, New York, and had been made, maintained her official, her official residence in Detroit last two years, and the paperwork was written by Josephine Coles of New York. So she was back in France, September 28th. She was there to present a petition to Mozaffar al-Din Shah Qajar, the ruler of Iran, with uh, Mir Miriam Haney while the Shah was there. She was not immediately welcome. A picture of Lua and associates was taken in Paris. At some point during the stay in Paris, she made contact with Doña Eugenie de Montijo, the last empress of the French and then widow of Emperor Napoleon III, and attempted to present the religion to her, but she rejected the offer. So, Napoleon III rejected, I guess he's his wife rejected too. Lua began prolonged prayer vigils to be allowed to present a petition in person to the Shah. Hippolyte Dreyfus, the first French Baha'i, assisted Lua by translating the petition in French and to gain an audience. At first, only granted a meeting with the Grand Vizier. Lua pressed the matter and finally met directly with the Shah himself. The petition was for the Baha'is to be granted an audience with him that he protect the Baha'is of Persia and that he asked the Sultan of Turkey to allow Abdul Baha freedom to travel. So I don't know, this is quoted from, I don't have the, the footnotes here, but anyway, this is it's, it's 200 notes in this article of Wikipedia that you can find if you just Google, Google Lua Getzinger. In the grand reception hall of the Elysee Palace, where the entire suite of 100 50 Persians were awaiting His Majesty. This one American woman, the only woman in this large group of men, stepped forward and handed to His Majesty the petition she had faithfully written. Lua also delivered a forceful speech suggesting that such uncivilized cruelty was shaming Persia and that if the mullahs examined the history of Islam, they would soon see that the shedding of blood is not a means of annulling, but rather the cause of promulgating every religious movement. Lua then told the assembled men a heartbreaking story, a heart-rending story of a woman whose husband, brother, and 11-year-old son were viciously killed by mobs, and when the woman throws herself upon the mangled corpses, she's beaten into insensibility. Lua asked the Shah, is it justice on the part of your majesty to allow such heinous crimes to go unpunished? He agreed to intercede on behalf of the Baha'is, but that the freedom of the Baha he could not grant. Lua then began plans to leave for Constantinople to appeal to the Ottoman Caliph but directly, but Abdul Baha intervened and prevented that appeal. However, Conditions in Iran only subsided a few years. Now, um, 
it's interesting the all the trips she made. I mean, you know, so she not only went to see Abdul Baha to get instructions and to get deep in and to help his daughters learn English and and translate. She translated, I think, the tablet of Thomas Breakwell. But she, as I read, you know, she traveled all over the place in the U.S. Sometimes alone, sometimes with her husband, I guess, with Dr. Farid. Um, but uh, there's trips that she made with her husband, the first and the last, I think, but then others she made on her own. She made some trips, I guess the fifth trip, she took Stan Woodcock, who was teaching in Constantinople. She took him the first trip. She accompanied him. She also took him a second time. So, I mean, you know, rare. I don't think anybody made so many trips to see Abdul Baha. Seven or eight. You know, thinking that you take the boat is 15 days just to go there, 15 days to come back. So, so she she went back when she was teaching the kids, the family, she was without her husband. Um, there was a story in the, in the in the fourth trip. This is by May 1903. She was getting life. And um, they said there was like an incident in Haifa. Something happened. And there's different stories about what happened. It's a story. Um, a story of she's trying to walk in the, literally in the footsteps of Abdul Baha as he was walking on the beach. She, she and Abdul Baha were walking along the beach. Lua dropped behind and began placing her feet into his footprints. This one version. Baha'i uh, early Baha'i Muriel Eve Barrow Newhall tells the story which she says was told to her by Grace Roberts Ober, a spiritual child of Lua Getzinger. After a few moments, the master turned to ask what she was doing. I'm following you in your footsteps, said Lua. He turned away. <laughs> they walked on. A few moments later, he turned again. Do you wish to follow my footsteps? He asked. Oh, yes, said Lua. They walked on and Abdul Baha turned again. Lua. Do you wish to follow in my footsteps? His tone was louder and stern. Oh, yes, said Lua again. Then the third time he stopped and faced her. Lua, it was almost a shout. Do you wish to follow my footsteps? Oh, yes, said Lua for the third time. And with that, a great tarantula jumped out from a hill, hillock of sand and bit her ankle. Abdul Baha saw this and paid no attention, turning away and again walking. Lua followed, still fitting her footsteps into his. Her ankle swelled. Her pain became excruciating till finally she sank down with the agony of it. Then Abdul Baha picked her up and carried her to the ladies' quarters where the greatest holy leaf uh, took her to bed. The agony increased. Lua's temperature flamed. Delirium set in. Finally, the greatest holy leaf could stand it no longer and she implored Abdul Baha to heal her. He examined her carefully, then laid his hands gently on her forehead. The temperature drained away, her head cleared, and she was healed. And it was only later that it was explained to her that she had been suffering from a strange and virulent condition of her blood, which the bite of tarantula had cured. It was only later later that it was explained to her that she had been suffering from a strange and virulent condition of her blood which the bite of the tarantula had occurred. In another version, Lua Getzinger is stung by a scorpion and the fever and healing episodes are omitted. Abdul Bahas continues to walk until Lua's suffering is unbearable, then stops and gently tells her this is what it means to walk in my footsteps. The lesson remains consistent. Okay. Now, she did, not only she spoke, but she wrote many things. Anyway, one of the things she wrote or co-wrote was Notes of a Pilgrimage, which were published uh, as Mercy and Justice in 1904. In June, letters to Lua in Paris from Baha'is in Palestine called her mother. And indeed, Abdul Baha called her Ummul Mu'minin mother of the believers, a term also associated with the Islamic figure of Fatime. There are also 
stories where Abdul Baha said to look at Mr. Abu Fadil, who came to the States at the invitation of Abdul Baha to take care of the Americans, so to straighten out those people that had spread different kinds of interpretations of the faith and were, were seeking power and so on. And he told her to consider him as his as a father. And as you know, both died in in Egypt and both are buried, I guess, next to each other in Cairo. All right. I don't know. What time is it? I don't want to go over overboard here. Bye, guys. I think this is a... She... I think I read to you part of a letter that she wrote when she was kind of stuck in Egypt. She she was prepared to go and, and herald the covenant. She was planning to go to America. She didn't, didn't expect to die in Egypt at the age of 43. Uh, she said, uh, April 21st, 1915, from Port Said, she says, I arrived here a week ago from the island of Crete, having left Haifa on an American American cruiser in Des Moines, which brought away from Haifa 290 refugees and myself. I was ready to leave the middle of June on the USS Tennessee, but as some of the students in Beirut succeeded in getting away, Abdul Baha decided that I should stay until later. When the news filtered through of the possibility of America declaring war and our gunboat came to the very port of Haifa, he said, now is the time for you to go and give news to the friends in Egypt, Europe, and America. It is a long time that they are without my any word. I desire to send you to them after which you are to go and teach. Then he wrote a tablet to the friends in America, gave me my instructions, and they left. I shall send a photographic copy of the tablet on the next mail with a short account of the last few days in Haifa, which were stirring and moving once for everybody. Abdul Baha was well, uh, though surrounded with the greatest dangers and difficulties when I left. He left Haifa for Nazareth at noon, August 29th, and they sailed the next morning, August 30th. He has been encompassed by difficulties on all sides for months, and more specifically, since the locusts came and destroyed everything, which has caused hundreds to suffer and die from starvation. Because they ravaged the land. We were absolutely without news from any quarter for months and greatly wondered why no one from America wrote, as it was the only neutral country from which news could come. And now that must cease also as far as addressing Abdul Baha is concerned, but I do hope you will try and write. Write me the Sohrab, if only postcards. Letters via Constantinople must all pass the censorship, remember, so no word about war, politics, or prophecies. We passed through three bombardments, which were all localized, therefore no lives were lost. What the people are to do there this winter, only God knows the cold rains will be an added misery to their already manifold woes. It was wonderful to witness the calm majesty of Abdul Baha as he went about among the people whose only hope and help he is. I shall come to America as soon as possible, though I have work to do elsewhere first. She was planning to do work in Paris. I enclose, I don't know what kind of work. I enclose you a translation of the tablet above mentioned and will send photographic copy of the original next mail. I send the French translation made in Haifa by Shoki Effendi, Abdul Baha's grandson. Also the English, please let the friends see them. I have had such a fatiguing journey and feel so very exhausted physically that I cannot write more at present. Besides, I only just have time to catch the mail which closed at midnight. Perhaps please give my most sincere greetings to all in the service and love of the covenant of God, especially your dear wife, Mrs. Haney and Mrs. Parsons. Abdul Baha said, tell everyone now is the time to teach and spread the cause. The friends in Cairo are and here are all well and send greetings to all in Washington. 
All these days of trial and test, the whole world has been flung into the melting pot. Each individual must be put into the crucible and tried as gold is tried and refined as silver is refined. The center of the covenant now sitteth as a refiner, as I read that before, but I read it again. And it is he who judges the purity, capacity, and station of every servant. He is the divine assayer who accepts and rejects. He alone knows the hearts, and in him only can one find justice and truth. He is the judge of the high court in the supreme concourse who renders judgments in righteousness and stations the souls of his sincere worshippers. In this day, all must be sure that he is the center from which every living soul is sent forth and to which every faithful and sincere one must turn. More later, as ever you're faithful, faithfully in the center of the covenant, Lua. And that's it. Live till the age of 43. Okay, friends. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Violeta. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yesuda, nice to see you as always. And thank you, Vahe, Vahe, Avash, and Daniel Coltro. <laughs> thank you. It was beautiful. Thank you very much. Oh, it was a pleasure. Again, time with Abdul Baha. You always have to find yeah, ways. Amazing. To...